Now the part of the chapter that I'd like to focus on is beginning in verse number 18 there where it reads, And he saith unto them, Are ye so without understanding also? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him? Because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draft, purging all meats. And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. What I want to preach about this morning is the subject of evil thoughts or that which comes out of the heart of man and defiles the man. You see, when we look at this list of sins that Jesus gives, it pretty much runs the gamut of sin. I mean, we see fornication and adultery, but we also see things like theft and murder. We see covetousness, wickedness, deceit. You know, lying is covered under deceit, blasphemy, pride. I mean, what isn't covered in this list? I mean, there are 13 sins here that he lists that run the spectrum of major sins that people commit. And Jesus said, all of these things come from the heart of man. And so what I want to show you this morning through the scripture is that sin begins in our heart and it begins with evil thoughts in our mind that then lead us to evil actions. He says in verse number 21, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, and then he lists all those other actions that those evil thoughts lead to. Go, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 4. In the Old Testament, right after Psalms, the book of Proverbs, look at Proverbs chapter 4. I'll start reading in verse 20 while you turn there. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Look at verse 23 of Proverbs 4. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So again, the Bible is teaching us here to guard our heart, to make sure that our heart is right, because out of the heart are the issues of life. Jesus said that all sin is originating in the heart. It comes out of the heart. He says in verse 24, Put away from thee a froward mouth. And perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. And here, when God is teaching us that we need to guard our heart and keep our heart with all diligence, he talks about, you know, hearing the wrong things, listening to the wrong things, and looking at the wrong things, seeing the wrong things. Now go over, if you would, to Proverbs 23. Because back in the original list in Mark 7, Jesus said that from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and then listen to this one, an evil eye. So one of the sins that's listed there is an evil eye. And it's interesting, if you look up every time that that term is used, an evil eye, you'll kind of get an idea for what that term means. But look at Proverbs 23, first of all, in verse 4. It says, Labor not to be rich, cease from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings, they fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Eat not thou the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire thou his dainty meats. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. The morsel which thou hast eaten, shalt thou vomit up and lose thy sweet words. Now flip over to chapter 28. Passage, the one who has an evil eye is one who is greedy. Even when they give you something, even when they offer you something, they don't really want you to have it. They're a, a greedy, covetous person. He talks about in that passage also the desire to be rich. Those who covet wealth for themselves. Look at chapter 28, verse 22. It says, He that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye, and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. Flip back to Deuteronomy chapter 15. So, so far in these passages about an evil eye, they both had to do with wanting to be rich, desiring something that does not belong to you. Look back at Deuteronomy 15.9. This is actually the first time 
the term an evil eye is ever used. It says in Deuteronomy 15, 9, Beware that there be no thought in thy wicked heart. Notice that phrase, a thought in your wicked heart, saying the seventh year, the year of release is at hand, and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him not, and he cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin unto thee. Now, if we look at an evil eye in this scripture here, it has to do with a greedy person who doesn't want to help out the poor. He wants to hang on to all of his money. In Proverbs, it was somebody who really wanted to be rich. It was somebody who, even when they give you something, they begrudge it because they want to keep it all for themselves. That is what it means to have an evil eye. Go to Matthew 6, and I'm going to show you why this is so important to what we're talking about today. This is all kind of the foundation for the sermon. Go to Matthew 6, and we'll see another mention of the evil eye in Matthew 6. Look at verse 20 of Matthew 6. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So again, all these scriptures talk a lot about the heart, what we think in our heart our attitude, what we believe. It says in verse 22, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Now, do you think it's a coincidence that every passage about the evil eye that we looked at there, they all have to do with something about money, something about wanting to be rich, something about being greedy. Do you notice that? Every single one of them. That's what it means to have an evil eye. It's the eye that looks at that which does not belong to you and desires to have that. You look at the fancy house and you wish that you lived in a fancy house. It's covetousness. You look at the, the, the fancy car. You look at wealth and riches and you desire to be rich. You desire to have those things. And God says that if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. Do you see how this sin is one that can destroy the whole body? This one sin of just having an evil eye is enough to destroy your life and to lead you into all other sin. That's why the Bible said, for the love of money is the root of all evil. And it's funny because the modern Bible versions all change that. You know, the New King James, the, I don't know if the New King James changed it, but the NIV for sure changes it, the ESV, you know, New Living. You look it up in these versions and they change it to, well, it's, it's a root of many types of evil. And in fact, the modern version crowd has often mocked the King James for saying that the love of money is the root of all evil. And they say, come on, how could that possibly be true? How could it really be the root of all evil? But yet there are so many other scriptures that teach the exact same thing. Right. So it's not like that verse in the King James just stands alone by itself. In fact, there's all this supporting material saying, look, if your eye is evil, your whole body shall be full of darkness, which supports the fact that if you love money, if you covet possessions that don't belong to you, that will be the root of other evils in your life. In fact, all manner of evil. It is the root of all evil. It's, the, it's where it all begins. It's where it starts. That's what root means. Now, I'm going to skip the last one for sake of time, but if you would, flip over to Joshua chapter 7. I'll just tell you the last mention of evil eye that I wanted to turn to while you're turning to Joshua 7 was in Matthew 20. And for sake of time, I'll just quickly tell you that in Matthew 20, there's a parable about a man who hires day laborers. And at the beginning of the day, he hires some day laborers. You know, sometimes you'll see guys standing outside Home Depot or whatever, you know, and they're just there to, to be hired for the day and they just want to work and, and make a living, or maybe at a temp agency, or, or there's even a day labor place in this parking lot where, where people show up and they get hired for the day. And then he needs more laborers, so he goes out at the third hour, he goes out at the sixth hour, he goes out at the ninth hour, he keeps hiring more workers. Finally, at the eleventh hour, there's only one hour of the workday left, he hires these guys. And, and, and the guys at the beginning of the day, he had made a deal with them for one penny, for the whole day's work, you know, 
You got to factor inflation, folks. But anyway, so, you know, he, he agreed with them for a penny. But the other people that came at the third, sixth, ninth, and eleventh hour, he made no agreement with them. He just said, I'll give you what's right. I'll give you a fair wage. Well, what he ends up doing is he gives the guys from the beginning of the day the penny that they earned and deserved and had agreed upon. But then he just gives everyone else a penny also. So even the guy who only worked one hour was paid the same amount as the guy who worked all day. Now, th this made them very upset, okay? And God is trying to teach us with that. I mean, there's a lot in that story, but what he's trying to teach, part of it is just that, you know, we shouldn't worry so much about what other people are receiving. God's treating us fairly. God's been good to us. If we agreed for a price, we were willing to work for that price. We worked all day and that's what we got. We shouldn't be looking at, well, what's he getting? You know, and that's how kids are, aren't they? Like, you know, children, you could give them a slice of cake and they're really happy to have that piece of cake and they got a glass of milk and the four, and they're really happy. But then get, give their brother twice as much. Now all of a sudden, oh, I got this tiny piece, you know. It's, it's the sinful nature that wants to begrudge other people from receiving a bonus or receiving extra or receiving more than we've received. God's trying to teach us just to worry about ourselves. But, but, but when the householder is rebuking the ones who complained, even though they got exactly what they bargained for, he says to them, is thine eye evil because I am good? So again, they're looking at somebody else and murmuring. They're greedy. They, they, they wish they had more. They're coveting these people who had worked one hour and got paid. So the evil eye is pretty consistent throughout Scripture. What is, it's always about money. You know, it pretty much always has to do with uh, covetousness or greed or wanting something that doesn't belong to you. Let me show you the formula for how sin happens in our lives. Where do these 13 sins come from that Jesus listed? He said they all come from the heart. They all come out of the heart of man. And he listed off everything from adultery to murder to robbery. Look down at Joshua 7 verse 21. It says, when I saw, this is Achan speaking, when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. And in this one verse, we have the formula here of sin. He saw, he coveted, he took. Okay? First, it started with his eye, his thought, his heart, coveting, then he committed the act of taking, and then the next thing that happens, he dies. He's killed. Now, this is exactly what the Bible says in James 1. You don't have to turn there, but in James 1, it says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And that's exactly what we see in the story about Achan. The Bible's real consistent on this, that all sin begins in our heart, and it all begins with evil thoughts or wrong thoughts proceeding out of our heart. He said, lust conceives and brings forth sin, sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The word lust is synonymous with the word covetousness. Because the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 7, I had not known lust except that the scripture had said, thou shalt not covet. He, he defined lust as being the committing of the sin of covetousness. That's what it is. Over and over again, the Bible warns us about having evil thoughts, about thinking the wrong thing, about looking at the wrong thing. We need to keep our heart with all diligence. You see, a lot of people think that just because their actions are right, it doesn't matter what they think about. It doesn't matter what's going on in their mind. And yet God tells us that the thoughts of our heart are eventually going to destroy us and lead us into sin if we have a corrupt eye. If we have an evil eye, our whole body is going to be filled with darkness. If we lust in our heart, lust will bring forth sin. If we are covetous, that will be the root of all evil in our life. These are sins that take place in the mind. So what are the main sins today that take place in people's minds? Well, first of all, we already talked about it, covetousness. 
Covetousness is a major sin that it's not really an action. Because if we look at the, you know, the Ten Commandments or, or typical lists of sins, a lot of them are something that you physically do, right? You know, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. You know, you're actually doing some work there. You're, you're building something. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Okay, that's a physical act. Even uh, the Old Testament command of remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. There was an action of resting there. You know, you're actually doing something or rather not doing something. And then he says, you know, honor thy father and mother. That command to honor father and mother is always coupled with actions that we should and should not do. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, honor thy father and mother. There's an action there of obeying your parents. There's an action when you steal. There's an action when you commit murder. You're actually committing an act. When you commit adultery, obviously you're committing a physical act there. But covetousness is the, the tenth of the Ten Commandments. Covetousness is the one that takes place in your mind. It takes place in your heart when you just wish that you had something that you don't have. Now, it seems innocent upon the surface. So what if I just wish that I had something? Well, I just wish I was married to somebody else. Or, well, I just wish I had a different job. Well, I just wish I had a, a car that I can't afford. Well, I just, and, and some people literally would listen to this and say, is that even a sin? Really? Because our society is so covetous. And that's why we see so much other evil in our society, because the thoughts of men's hearts have become evil. Remember when God destroyed the earth with a flood? Why did he do it? Because he looked down upon the earth and he said that the thoughts of men's hearts were only evil continually. And because the thoughts of their heart were evil, because their minds were evil, next thing you know, the whole earth is filled with violence as a result of the evil heart and the evil thought. How do we get evil thoughts and, 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 and how do we get this wicked heart where all these sins come, come out? Because if we want to live a clean life, if we want to live a Christian life, we must first cleanse that which is within the cup and the platter that the outside may be clean also. Isn't that what Jesus said? I mean, if we're going to clean up our life, if we're going to live a life that's pure and right and godly, the first thing that has to be cleaned up is our mind. The first thing that has to be cleaned up is our heart. The first thing that has to be cleaned is what's on the inside. We must get control of our thoughts and our heart because that is what's going to defile us, the heart of man. Our external circumstances can't destroy us. It's not the devil that can just destroy us. I mean, he can try to get into our heart and he can try to show us things and, and teach us things and, and influence us to commit these sins, but really, when we commit sin, we, we can't really blame anyone but ourselves in the end. Because the sin came from our own lust. We can't say, well, God tempted me. Or, well, you know, uh, it was the devil that made me do it. No, it says it's from within your heart that these things come from. That's where sin originates, in the mind, in the heart. That's why covetousness is so dangerous. That's why I preach so much against covetousness. And, and people sometimes think, oh, you're just splitting hairs. You're making a big deal out of nothing. But yet this is the starting point. You know, you need to learn. And what's the opposite of covetousness? Contentment. Being happy with what you have. And you need to learn in whatsoever state you're in, therewith to be content. You cannot live a godly life. You cannot live a clean life when you are constantly wanting things that don't belong to you. You can't do it. You will go into sin if that's your mentality. You need to every day, the Bible says, be, give thanks unto the Lord and in everything give thanks and bless the Lord and be thankful for what you have and content with what you have. And the Apostle Paul said, you know, he's in a prison cell or, or he's thriving, but he said, I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And you see, when we go to the list of sins, let's go back to the list now, now that we kind of understand the formula a little bit of where sin comes from. Because we've seen the formula over and over, haven't we? Evil thoughts, a wicked heart, thinking, covetous thoughts, they lead us into all other sins, according to the Bible. We must keep our heart with all diligence. We must clean up the inside of the cup in order to have an outside that's clean. But let's look at the list now in Mark 7. Mark chapter 7, 
Verse number 20, it says, He said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts. And then what's the next thing on the list? Adulteries. Adulteries. And then we can kind of group that in with the third thing, fornication, right? Because adultery and fornication are two very similar sins. The difference between the two is that adultery is one that's committed by someone who is married. Someone who is married, who uh, basically goes to bed with someone that's not their spouse, that is called adultery. And one who is unmarried, but has a physical relationship, goes to bed with someone that they're not married to, that is called fornication. Okay, so those two sins are similar. And God is telling us here that both adultery and fornication start out in the heart of man. You don't just one day just find yourself in a situation where, boom, you're just committing adultery. You're just committing fornication. No, there's a process <coughs> that leads you to commit adultery. There's a process that leads you to commit fornication. You know, if you look at men in the Bible who committed adultery, you could see all the things that led up to them committing adultery. They, didn't, they weren't just living a godly, righteous life and had a great relationship with their spouse, and then one day they just were tempted and just committed adultery. I don't believe that for one second. People who commit adultery have had a wicked thought life for a very long time before they just go out and commit adultery. They've already had covetous in their, covetousness in their heart. They've already had evil thoughts long before they go out and commit adultery. Because lust conceives. And if you think about a pregnancy, how long does a typical pregnancy last? You know, my wife and I are asking ourselves that. Okay? You know, how long does a typical pregnancy last? Nine months. So is it just, it's not just instantaneous. There's just conception, birth. No. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Does it bring it forth immediately? Not necessarily. The evil thoughts can germinate and gestate and then eventually it brings forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. Think about this. You know, in order to commit adultery, first you have to start being discontented with your spouse. That's where it starts. And if we look at David who committed adultery, was he content with his wife? Was he content with his spouse? Well, if he were, he wouldn't have added a second one. Right? You know, and if you look at Abraham who committed adultery with Hagar, you know, what did he covet that he didn't have? He really wanted a, a son. And God already promised him you're going to have a son. God already told him, you know, to wait on him and to trust in him and have faith in him. But he coveted that which did not belong to him. He wanted a son. And then that eventually led him to commit adultery with Hagar. You know, we look at other men in the Bible who committed adultery. You're going to see similar patterns. You're going to see things that led up to it. You can see it coming a mile away. It doesn't just happen overnight. And so if we're going to live a clean life, we need to straighten out our thought life. So if we're going to avoid the, the, the first few sins on the list here, we see a couple sins on the list here, adultery and fornication. If we're going to avoid those sins, we need to get our thoughts right. Number one, we must realize, of course, that lust and covetousness is the root of all evil. That's where everything starts. That's the beginning point of sin. And so, first of all, you must decide, adultery, for example, that you are content with the spouse that you have. You must love your wife. You must love your husband and be satisfied with your wife or be satisfied with your husband and not even have the evil thought that says, I wish my husband were more like so-and-so. I wish I was married to someone more like her. And, you know, you might sit there and think that, oh, well, lust, that's looking at a dirty magazine. You know what? That's true. That is lust. Oh, that's looking at a, a filthy movie. But you know what? It's just as much lust. When you have these kind of evil thoughts in your mind toward your wife that says, oh, I just, I just wish I was married to a woman that, that would nag me less, more like so-and-so. I'd rather be married to someone a little more like so-and-so. Or I'd rather be married to someone who appreciated me a little more. You know, or my wife is this, you know. When we get bitter toward our wife, that is also a seed in our mind that could lead us to go looking somewhere else when we ought to be content with what we have at home. And then same thing, we could flip around the gender and say, you know, a woman who wishes that she were married to a guy who made more money. 
You don't think a woman has ever had that thought? I wish I were married to a man who made more money, you know, because this stupid house I live in and this stupid car and we don't even have a car and we don't even have a house. and all. You know what? That is a wicked thought. And you say, well, what's wrong with just wanting to live in a nicer house? What's wrong? It's a sin that's what's wrong with it. What's wrong with wishing that we dr drove a bigger car or a fancier car? What's wrong with wishing that I was married to a man who made more money? Because it's sin and because it will lead you to a bigger sin when you start thinking those kind of evil thoughts. We need to take heed unto our thought life. We, you're not, if you just let your mind just wander, you're going to think stupid thoughts. I mean, think about it. We are sinners. We have a sinful flesh. The Bible says every day we must put on the new man. We must uh, deny self and take up the cross daily and follow. If we just wake up in the morning and walk in the flesh, we're going to think the wrong types of things. Right. Especially because the world around us leads us into a lot of bad thought life. And they put a lot of ideas into our head that are the wrong ideas. We need to make sure that when we get up in the morning, we take control of our thoughts and we make sure that the thoughts that we have toward our spouse are not evil thoughts. The Bible says, husbands, love your wives. It says that wives should love their husbands. We shouldn't even let these thoughts come in of just thinking, oh, I, I, I just hate such and such about my wife. Oh, I'm just so sick of her doing this. I'm so sick of her doing that. Oh, I'm just so sick of him doing this. And I just hate it when he does it. Just sitting and thinking about the things you don't like about your spouse. That right there is where adultery begins. Believe it or not, that's where it begins. Because if you're in love with your spouse and you're happy with them and you have good feelings toward them, you're not out looking for someone else because your love is directed toward them. Your desire is unto them. Okay. And this is something that we need to be aware of. But... On, uh, also, let's, let's get off adultery now, okay? Fornication. And we can talk about the other aspect of lust, which would be picking up the, the magazine or, or, you know, uh, today probably would be more surfing the internet. Now, somebody recently said to me, you know, I never hear you preach about internet pornography and it's so bad and you need to preach about internet pornography. But honestly... The reason that you don't hear me preaching a lot about internet pornography is because of the fact that it's just not a very wholesome subject to talk about. You know, I don't want, I don't like to, t I, I try to keep my preaching as clean as the Bible is. You know, so I don't want to go into details or be graphic of things that are not really covered in the Bible because I don't want to defile those that are pure. There are so many people here, children and even, even adults who are, pure in many areas. I don't want to, I don't want to ever expose people to things that would defile them. I don't want to be the one who puts an idea into their mind through their ears or through their eyes that would cause them to have evil thoughts or that would cause their heart to be defiled or pure. So I always want to keep my preaching clean, but at the same time I do have to preach against sin. And so where I draw the line is I preach in words that the Bible uses, and I use terminology because I know that the Bible is clean and right, and I know that the Bible will lead no one astray. We read our children the Bible from the time they're born, and when they're two, three, four, we read them the Bible. We don't skip certain parts of the Bible and say, well, this part isn't for kids. You know, it's all good for kids. God's Word is clean and pure. The Bible says every word of God is pure. So that's why you're not going to hear me go into great detail about, you know, the evils of internet pornography. But let me tell you something. The Bible makes it clear. It says that whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And there is an abundance of of pornography on the internet today and it is a major problem you know you can look up statistics on this and see I think like 30 percent of all internet traffic goes to pornographic websites I mean it, it, that's a, just a pretty staggering number you know I, there are all kinds of statistics about you know 25 percent of people who have a work computer use it to look at so, so I mean this is a big problem it is a major problem and it does need to be preached against let me just let me just say it to you this way if you're married you know and you're going on the computer and looking at internet pornography I mean that is such a hurtful thing to your spouse I mean, and you have to remember that Jesus said, 
All things whatsoever you would that men should do unto you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets, known as the golden rule. You know, you wouldn't want your spouse on the internet lusting after someone else. Why would you do that then? You know, it's a two-way street. You need to be respectful of your spouse and, and keep yourself only unto her or only unto him so long as you both shall live. And, you know, when it comes to internet pornography, it's probably more men that fall into this trap or are, are guilty of this sin. I don't know, but it, that, that would seem to, you know, you'd seem to think so. Women have their own sins that they're, you know, have a tendency to fall into. This is one that maybe is a little more targeted toward men. And let me say this. It is something that will easily destroy your marriage. Now, I know people. I could tell you about people. And I'm not going to, of course. But I could tell you people who the man went on the computer, looked at internet pornography, and as soon as his wife found out, she divorced him and had nothing to do with, never wanted anything to do with it ever again. No matter how much he apologized, no matter how much he said he was sorry, no matter how much he repented, she just said, no, I want nothing. Now look, that isn't right. Obviously, the Bible teaches that we should forgive and so forth, and she should have forgiven him. But I'm just telling you the realities of how hurtful this can be to a relationship that I could give you specific examples of people that I know, multiple examples of where a wife found her husband looking at pornography just could never forgive that, never get over it. Now look, the wife was wrong to do that because we should forgive our spouse. We should be with our spouse until death. But that shows you how damaging this can be. It's not a little thing. It's not a small thing. Today in our society, it has become acceptable in our culture for men to just put posters up in the garage of women in bikinis and all, you know, that is so hurtful. And, and even wives might even say, oh, it doesn't bother me. I'm okay with that. She's lying because no wife is okay with that. Every, you know, no wife wants to think that her husband gets more enjoyment out of looking at someone else than her. It's wicked. It's ungodly. If you have that type of poster in your garage, you need to go home and tear it off the wall and get rid of all the, 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 the magazines, even, even the, the so-called milder, you know, the Sports Illustrated swimsuit edition needs to go in the trash. Amen. Amen. Any, that stuff needs to go in the, you don't need that stuff. You need to make sure that you're not lusting, and you say, well, I can handle it, it doesn't affect me. You know what, you're playing with fire, and that lust is gonna conceive, and it's gonna bring forth sin, and out of a wicked heart proceeds adultery. And so you need to make sure, but, but listen to the single man as well. Internet pornography is also very dangerous. And, and the magazines, all the same preaching applies to fornication because the single young man is even more, is even more likely to commit fornication than the married man is to commit adultery. If you think about it, because by, the Bible even says that to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So the single man, OK, because he is not active in that area, because he is hopefully, you know, as the Bible commands him to be virgin and clean and pure, he is at an even greater temptation and is even more likely to commit fornication and to go into that grievous sin. You say, well, what's the big deal about fornication? Fornication is a major sin. Right. Amen. God killed 23,000 people in one day because of fornication according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Fornication is a sin. The Bible tells us to flee it. I mean, almost every chapter that the Apostle Paul wrote, he's preaching against fornication. I mean, almost more than any other sin. It's a huge sin. And a lot of young men get sucked into this, and it starts out milder. But sin always takes you further than you wanted to go. Right. It always keeps you longer than you wanted to stay, and it always costs you more than you were willing to pay. You know, it reminds me of uh, a guy that I knew that was, you know, smoked pot. Ah, eh, just smoking pot, no big deal. Except one day, the pot that he was given from his dealer was laced with something other than pot. And he ended up being on some kind of a crazy trip for days and days from some hardcore drugs that were put into his pot. Now, that's not what he signed on for when he decided to smoke pot, did he? You know, he decided to smoke pot. 
He just wanted to smoke a little pot, whatever. But you know what? He ended up frying his brain majorly with something else. Because you know what? God is not going to bless you when you're committing sin. And when you commit a small sin, it always leads to a bigger sin and it escalates. And you know, you start out, you know, just looking at the lingerie ad or you start out just looking at the swimsuit edition or whatever. And you're just curious and you're a young man. And you know what? Pretty soon you're going to look at more, you're going to look at more, you're going to justify it more and more, and you're going to get into worse and worse and worse things. And look, this is the way internet pornography is set up. You go to look at one thing, and then all of a sudden it hits you with a bunch of other stuff. I mean, think about it. Do you think that people who run internet pornography sites are, are godly people? No. Or do you think that they're honest businessmen? Do you think that they have any integrity whatsoever? So therefore, and again, I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's not a very wholesome subject, but the thing is, you'll go on there expecting to look at something that you're comfortable with, you know, just a little sin. You know, you're just going to play around with a little sin. You know, you just want to look at, you know, the bikini babe or the underwear, whatever. You know, but what happens is they'll escalate it for you. Because other stuff will start popping up and po other windows will start opening and they'll start emailing you, whatever. And you'll get into stuff that was way worse and way weirder than you ever bargained. Just talk to anybody who's been involved in it. That's what they'll tell you. And it gets you sucked in to worse and bigger sins. This is why we need to just nip it in the bud and just not even have the covetousness and evil thoughts in the first place. Not even look upon a woman to lust after in the first place. And look, I know it's hard in the day that we live in for a young man. I was a teenager once. I know what it's like. And you know why it's so hard for teenagers? Because of the fact that it's everywhere you go, it's being crammed down your throat. See, out of sight, out of mind. You know, back in the old days, if you're a teenage boy, you weren't just constantly having these images and having just scantily clad women around you and billboards and magazines and TV and movies just bombarding you with it. Look, obviously it's going to be hard to keep yourself pure when you're being bombarded with all this stuff, but God demands you to be pure. And your life depends upon it. It will destroy your life if you commit fornication. There will be consequences that you will live with for the rest of your life. Now, obviously, you should try to limit your exposure to this garbage as much as you can. But some of it you can't escape because we, just, we live in a society where in the summertime, women are going to dress scantily clad, you know, and, and there's nothing you can do about that. Okay, but you can avoid watching it on TV by not having a TV, by not watching TV. And you know what? Think about this. Let me just explain it to you this way. If you were fasting from food, right? Where do you think the best place would be to be fasting from food? In a kitchen? <laughs> In a restaurant? I remember one time I was, I, I, I was a teenager, I was fasting, I worked at Round Table Pizza. You know, I'm cooking food and I was fasting. You know, that doesn't work very well. Because you're just, you're smelling the food, you're looking for, it'd be a lot easier if you weren't around food, if you were busy with other things. So obviously, the, if you're just going to sit there and just watch TV, and what's TV going to constantly bring up to you? The bedroom, the bedroom, the bedroom, the bedroom, indecently dressed women, indecently dressed women, just showing you it, showing you, showing you, showing you. It's going to be harder to stay pure than if you had hobbies and work to do and things to do with your time that were not constantly remind you of something that is unavailable to you. Because that, you know, that act is unavailable to you until you get married. Then you can enjoy it legitimately. But until then, you want to try to not just be bombarded with it by looking at TV and movies and advertising that's just constantly pushing that on you. I mean, isn't this just make sense? It's common sense. That's why the Bible says, make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. You can't just surround yourself with all this stuff and then just hope to keep a pure mind. Hope to, you know, that's why you shouldn't live in Las Vegas, Nevada. Amen. Good night. That, it's impossible to keep a pure mind in that place. Just everywhere you look, it's just filth and smut and wickedness. The, you know, and thank God, you know, Phoenix isn't as bad, but still there is a lot of sin, there is a lot of wickedness, and we need to try to limit our exposure and keep our mind as pure as we can. Otherwise, it's just going to be harder to stay pure.
But we need to uh, keep a pure mind and, and, you know, if a man is going to keep himself pure until he's married or if a woman is going to keep herself pure until she's married, it starts with the thought life. And you need to realize that God expects you not only to abstain from fornication, but to abstain from thinking about committing fornication and looking upon a woman to lust after her in your heart. God says you've committed the act in your heart. You're guilty before God just for having those thoughts, just for looking. The Bible calls the lust of the eyes. He talks about having an evil eye. Turn, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Toward the end of the New Testament. <clears throat> And, you know, this is the thing that's dangerous about the Internet, too, is that it's anonymous, meaning that it used to be if you're a teenager and you wanted to be curious about things that you need to, you know, not be curious about, you'd have to go somewhere, you know, and, and go find this stuff. And, you know, you're probably not going to find it or, or it's going to be difficult to find. But now with computers and Internet, people can just in the privacy of their home, just completely anonymously, they can just go on the computer and look at this stuff. And this is why, listen to me now, you should not give your teenagers or children unfettered access to the internet. Amen. I mean, think about it. You're, you understand that a child is foolish. The Bible says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. We all started out simple and foolish and ignorant. Nobody was just born with wisdom and knowledge and understanding. We all started out foolish, and as we get older, we learn things. As we get older, we get smarter, we get more intelligent, we get wiser, hopefully. But a child cannot be expected to have the same level of wisdom and knowledge and restraint about the Internet as an adult. Now look, I've heard some people say the Internet is evil, don't even use the Internet. There are legitimate uses for the internet. You know, I do my banking on the internet. You know, you can research things on the internet. You can get a lot of great knowledge. You know, you can listen to preaching off the internet. You can, you can go to Bible software on the internet. There, there's a lot of business use. There's a lot of communication you can do through emails and through, you know, through going to legitimate websites and, and godly websites. You know, and, and a lot of people, they protect their computer with antivirus software. And I'm not against it. I, I, I'm not really a super duper computer expert, but I do know something about computers. You know, my, and, and, and you know, I'm, I'm, people are going to correct me about this after the service, I'm sure. But my thought was, you know, usually you get computer viruses usually from going to sites that are questionable. Now, I'm sure that you can go to normal sites and do perfectly normal activities and pick up a virus. I'm sure people will tell me that after the service. But, I'll tell you this though, going to questionable sites is where most viruses are going to be. I mean, when you go to ungodly websites, that's where you're going to get infected. Because the people who are running a site like that, they don't have integrity. See what I mean? So that's where a lot of the viruses and things get picked up is, is through a lot of wicked websites. But let me say this, and I want to teach you something about computers. Because like I said, I'm not a super duper computer expert. But there are many computer experts in the room today that could probably verify that what I'm about to say is true, because I do know something about computers. But most people don't know what I'm about to tell you. And what I'm about to tell you is a, is a very interesting piece of information that I would say 99% of people don't know. And that is this. Every, every image that you ever look at on your computer, are you listening? I'm not saying you downloaded it. I'm not saying you saved it to your hard drive. I'm saying every image that you've ever seen on your computer is stored on your computer. And you say, that's not true, Pastor Anderson. You're wrong. My computer doesn't even have enough memory for that. You're wrong. You're wrong. I'm right. And I'll prove it to you. Now, who, who here is a computer professional? Put up your hand if you, if you are a computer professional, meaning your job is a computer job. Okay, who have we got here? Sean Fairchild, we got Brother Tom, we got the Jordans over here. Anybody else? So we got, you know, four or five computer guys. The reason that I know this for a fact is because I have retrieved successfully every picture that anyone has ever looked at from a computer. And here's why. And I'm going to use this whiteboard as an illustration. 
Okay. This whiteboard right here, and, and, you know, it would probably be even more of an illustration if we were to use a chalkboard, right? Because when you write something on the chalkboard, okay, and then you erase it, it's gone, right? But you can still kind of see it, right? And you know, with a chalkboard, you can kind of see everything that's ever been written a little bit, even though it's been erased. It's sort of like when you used to have a cassette tape back in the old days, and you'd record over, but didn't you kind of still hear what used to be on it? Real quiet. You remember that? Who's had that experience? Well, this is how I learned this. Okay. I had a computer hard drive that, that, that failed. And computer hard drives always fail. Every computer I've ever had that broke is because the hard drive failed. Okay. So then I bought a computer that didn't have a hard drive. It had a solid state memory, and then it failed. Uh, what in the world? You know, it's always the memory that fails. But I had a hard drive, and this thing had failed, and I wanted to retrieve the data off this thing. Okay. But it wouldn't mount with the operating system. So I got one of those external plug-in kits where you can just take the hard drive and just plug it in and wire it through to the USB. And you know, I'm, I hook it up to the thing and it, it's not being recognized by the computer. You know, the computer just can't see it. it. It won't respond. Well, I bought a software called Disk Drill. You know, I think it was like a 60 bucks or 100 bucks. But I bought this software called Disk Drill. And it said that you could do, a, you know, a scan of the hard drive or you could do a deep scan, okay? And this disk drill, even if it's not seeing the hard drive, it could still go in and see it. So I hooked this thing up to Disk Drill Pro and I did a deep scan. It's like 57 hours remaining or whatever. Okay, you know, so I just left. Day, days and days went by doing the deep scan. And all of a sudden, it comes back. It's like, okay, we've scanned your hard drive, and these are the files we've found. And it was, it was more files than could even fit on my computer. It was like, you know, the, let's say the hard drive is a 100 gig hard drive, you know, and there's like 10 times that much data on this hard drive. And I'm thinking, to myself, how does that work? This thing has a capacity of, you know, X, and yet there's 10 times as much on this hard drive. And then I, go, I went to photos, and it was like, instead of just showing me the typical photos that I would have had on my computer, it was just tens of thousands of photos, okay? So I hooked it up to a bigger hard drive, and I, I dumped everything that it had found through drilling it. I dumped it all onto the big hard drive. And so I have this folder of 10,000 some photos, and I'm like, what are these photos? I did not have 10,000 photos on my computer. So I started just looking through them, just clicking on them, just, just going through them, going through them, going through them, going through them. And it was just like every picture that you'd ever seen on the internet, just any, because a lot of stuff goes temporarily onto your machine. Because if you think about it, in order for you to see a picture on the screen, it, you know, it, it, it really, it downloads that picture into a temporary folder where it displays it for you to look at it, right? And then when you click out of it, it deletes it out of that temporary folder. But for you to be looking at it, it has to be on your computer or else how are you looking at it? Does everybody understand? So this uh, folder of pictures was like every picture that had ever been on your computer, including just anything that you just looked at on the internet, okay? Now, this is why you'll sometimes hear people say, hey, the FBI, got this guy's computer, right? And it was his work computer and they found 5,000 pictures of, you know, indecency or 5,000 pictures of, of pornography. And, and you're thinking to yourself, why is this guy storing 5,000, you know, filthy pictures on his work computer at a Christian school? Is it, you know, what in the world? But now do you understand where they got those 5,000 pictures? Now, who already knew that? Put up your hand if you already knew that. Can you verify that what I'm saying is true? Yeah, for the most part. What do you disagree with me? No. I'm just I'm just telling you, there's more on your hard drive than you think is on that hard drive. Because of the fact that when you erase the chalkboard, you write over it, you erase it, if you really did a deep scan of that chalkboard, you're gonna find everything that's ever been written on that chalkboard. And so what I'm trying to say is that uh, what am I trying to say? 
don't look at weird stuff on your computer. You might get busted for stuff that you thought you could get away with. And the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. So that should just be a sobering thought where you think, oh yeah, I can look at all this stuff and get away with it. You might not even get away with it because of the fact that stuff's being stored on your computer that you don't even know about. That should make you think twice before looking at this filth. But not only that, God knows. Even if you never get caught, even if nobody ever takes a disk drill pro you know, <laughs> to your computer and figures out what you've been doing, you know, God knows what you're doing. And by the way, your mind, here's where it ties in with the sermon, your mind is the same way as that hard drive. That's right? right? You, 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 you see stuff, you hear stuff, and then you forget about it, right? But it's still there, though. Because have you ever forgot about something for years and years and years, but then someone will remind you of it? Hey, you remember that? And it was something you had forgotten. You had deleted from your mental hard drive. Hey, remember that? And then you're like, oh yeah. And then boom, the whole image comes back. The whole story comes back. All the details come back. Why? Because everything that goes into your mind remains. Things go in, but they don't go out. Now that should be a sobering thought. That's why God said, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. When we just are constantly allowing bad things to come in, con and, and when he said nothing coming into the man can defile him, he's talking about eating food. He's talking about unsanitary. But look, what can defile the man is what comes into the eyes, what comes into the ears. That's what he brings up as being the things that defile your heart. And once wicked things come into your eyes and ears, they go into your heart, and then out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Out of the heart come the issues of life. Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. Out of the heart proceed adulteries, fornication. If you're a young man and you want to stay pure and you don't want to commit fornication, you need to stop looking at this garbage. You need to stop getting as close to sin as you can without going all the way over the cliff. You're just making it harder on yourself. You're just making it more difficult to abstain from that. You just need to get it out of sight, out of mind. That's the best way to abstain from that. Amen. Get yourself busy with other things other productive work to do than to just sit there and watch the world's filth, which is going to remind you of that. You know, what there's statistics about every seven seconds, or you know, not seven seconds, every seven minutes, there's a reference to it on TV. Or, you know, you can find the statistics on that. But we need to realize that we need to get our thoughts under control if we're going to live a clean life. We need to get the lust out of our heart, get the covetousness out of our heart, not look at pornography, whether it's on the television or on the internet, not look at it, not think about it, not ponder it, and to be content with such things as we have. And to be happy with what we have and not always wishing that we had something that we don't have. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Father, please just help this message to sink down into our ears, Lord. Please just help us to stay as far away from sin as we can. Uh, we don't want to go into these things like theft and murder and robbery and, and adultery and fornication, blasphemy. Lord, help us not to even start the decline toward these things by having a filthy mind. Help us to keep our minds pure. Help us to read your word every day and think about your word, meditate on it. Help us to think good, positive thoughts toward our, our wives or husbands, Lord. Help us to think uh, godly thoughts and fill our minds with scripture and good things so that we don't just have this cesspool of iniquity in our mind that will lead us into all manner of sin, if not sooner than later, Lord. Please just help us to, to take this message to heart. In Jesus' name we pray.